chapter two. <clears throat> the biographer is now faced with a difficulty which it is better perhaps to confess than to gloss over. Perhaps to this point in telling the story of Orlando's life, documents both private and historical have made it possible to fulfil the first duty of a biographer, which is to plod without looking to right or left in the indelible footprints of truth. I'm enticed by flowers regardless of shade, on and on methodically, till we'll fall plump into the grave and right finish on the tombstone above our heads. But now we come to an episode which lies right across our path, so that there is no ignoring it. Yet it is dark, mysterious and undocumented, so that there is no explaining it. Volumes might be written in interpretation of it, whose religious system is founded upon the signification of it. Our simple duty is to state the facts as far as they are known. And so let the reader make them what he may. In the summer of that disastrous winter, which saw the frost, the flood, the deaths of many thousands, and the complete downfall of Orlando's hopes, for he was exiled from courts in deep disgrace with the most powerful nobles of his time, the Irish house of Desmond was justly enraged. The king had already trouble enough with the Irish not to relish this further addition. In the summer, Orlando retired to his great house in the country and there lived in complete solitude. One June morning, it was Saturday the 18th, he failed to rise at his usual hour and when his groom went to call him, he was found fast asleep, nor could he be awakened. He lay as if in a trance without perceptible breathing and though dogs were set to bark under his window, Symbols, drums, bones beaten perpetually in his room, a gorse bush put under his pillow, and mustard plasters applied to his feet. Still, he did not wake, take food, or show any sign of life for seven whole days. On the seventh day, he woke at his usual time, a quarter before eight precisely, and turned the whole posse of caterwauling wires and village soothsayers out of his room which was natural enough but what was strange was that he showed no consciousness of any such trance but dressed himself and sent for his horse as if he had woken from a single night's sleep yet some change it was suspected must have taken place in the chambers of his brain for although he was perfectly rational and seemed graver and more sedate in his ways than before he appeared to have an imperfect recollection of his past life he would listen when people spoke of the great frost, or the skating, or the carnival, but he never gave any sign except by passing his hand across his brow as if to wipe away some cloud of having witnessed them himself. When the events of the past six months were discussed, he seemed not so much distressed as puzzled, as if he were troubled by confused memories of some time long ago, or were trying to recall stories told him by another. It was observed that if Russia was mentioned, or princesses or ships, he would fall into a gloom of uneasy kind and get up and look out of the window or call one of the dogs to him or take a knife and carve a piece of cedar wood. But the doctors were hardly wiser than they were now, and after prescribing rest and exercise, starvation and nourishment, society and solitude, that he should lie in bed all day and ride forty miles between lunch and dinner together with the usual sedatives and ir irritants, diversified as they fancy took them, with possets of newt slobber on rising and draughts of peacock's gall on going to bed. They left him to himself and gave it as their opinion that he had been asleep for a week. But if sleep it was, of what nature we can scarcely refrain from asking are such sleeps as these. Are they rem remedial measures? Trances in which the most 
galling memories, events that seem likely to cripple life forever, are brushed with a dark wing which rubs their harshness off the gilds them. Even the ugliest and basest with a lustre and incandescence has the finger of death to be laid on the tumlet of a life from time to time lest it rend us asunder. Are we so made that we have to take death in small doses daily or we could not go on with the business of living? And when what strange powers are these that penetrate our most secret ways and change our most treasured possessions without our willing it? Had Orlando, worn out by the extremity of his suffering, died for a week and then come to life again? And if so, of what nature is death and of what nature life? Having waited well over half an hour for an answer to these questions and none coming, let us get on with the story. Now Orlando gave himself up to a life of extreme solitude. His disgrace at the court and the violence of his grief were partly the reason for it. But as he made no effort to defend himself and seldom invited anyone to visit him, though he had many friends, he would willingly have done so, it appeared as if to be alone in the great house of his father suited his temper. Solitude was his choice. How he spent his time nobody quite knew. The servants of whom he kept a full retinue, though, though much of their business was to dust empty rooms and to smooth the coverlets of beds that were never slept in, watched in the dark of the evening, as they sat over their cakes and ale, a light passing along the galleries, through the banqueting hall, up the staircase into the bedrooms, and knew that their master was peram perambulating the house alone. None dared follow him, for the house was haunted by a great variety of ghosts, and the extent of it made it easy to lose one's way and either fall down some hidden staircase or open a door which, should the wind blow it to, would shut upon one forever. Accidents of no uncommon occurrence, as the frequent discovery of the skeletons of men and animals in attitudes of great agony made evidence. Then the light would be lost almost altogether, and Mrs. Grimditch, the housekeeper, would say to Mr. Dupper, the chaplain, how she hoped his lordship had not met with some bad accident, Mr. Dupper would opine that his lordship was on his knees, no doubt among the tombs of his ancestors in the chapel, which was in the billiard table court half a mile away on the south side, for he had sins on his conscience. Mr. Dupper was afraid, upon which Mrs. Grimditch would retort rather sharply that she so had most of us, and Mr. Skulski, and Mrs. Field, and old Nurse Carpenter would all rise their voices in the Lordship's praise, and the grooms and the stewards would swear that it was a thousand pities to see so fine a nobleman moping about the house when he might be hunting the fox or chasing the deer, and even the little laundry maids and scullery maids and the Judies and the Faiths who were handing round the tankards and cakes would pipe up their testimony to his Lordship's gallantry for never was there a kinder gentleman, nor one more free with those little pieces of silver which served to buy a knot of ribbon or put a posy in one's hair, until even the blackamoor whom they called Grace Robinson, by way of making a Christian woman of her, understood what they were at, and agreed that his lordship was a handsome, pleasant, darling gentleman, in the only way she could, that is to say, by showing all her teeth at once. In a broad grin, in short, all his serving men and women held him in high respect and cursed the foreign princess, but they called her by a coarser name than that, who had brought him to this pass. But though it was probably cowardice or love of hot ale that led Mr. Duffer to imagine his lordship safe amongst the tombs so that he need not go in search of him, it may well have been that Mr. Duffer was right. Orlando now took a strange delight in thoughts of death and decay, and after pacing the long galleries and ballrooms with a taper in his hand, 
looking at picture after picture as if he sought the likeliness of someone whom he could not find would amount into the family pew and sit for hours watching the banners stir in the moonlight waver with a bat or death's head moth to keep him company. Even this was not enough for him, but he must descend into the crypts where his ancestors lie, coffin piled upon coffin for ten generations together. The place was so seldom visited that the rats made free with the lead work, and now a thigh bone would scratch at his cloak as he passed, or he would crack the skull of some old Sir Millace as it rolled beneath his foot. It was a ghastly... Sepulture. Dug deep beneath the foundations of the house as if the first lord of the family who had come from France with the conqueror had wished to testify how all pomp is built upon corruption. How the skeleton lies beneath the flesh, how we that dance and sing above must lie below. How the crimson velvet turns to dust, how the ring, here Orlando stooping his lantern would pick up a gold circle lacking a stone had rolled into a corner, loses its ruby, and the eye, which was so lustrous, shines no more. Nothing remains of all these princes, Orlando would say, indulging in some pardonable exaggeration of their rank, except one digit, and he would take a skeleton hand in his and bend the joints this way and that. Whose hand was it? He went on to ask. The right or the left? The hand of a man or a woman of age or youth had it urged the war horse or piled the needle had it plucked the rose or grasped cold steel had it but here either his invention failed him or what is more likely provided him with so many instances of what a hand can do that he shrank as his want was from the cardinal labour of composition which is ex excision and he put it with the other bones thinking how there was a writer called thomas brown a doctor of norwich whose writing upon such subjects took his fancy amazingly so taking his lantern and seeing that the bones were in order for the romantic he was singularly methodical and detested nothing so much as a ball of string on the floor let alone a skull of an ancestor he returned to that curious, moody pacing down the galleries, looking for something among the pictures, which was interrupted at length by a veritable spasm of sobbing at the sight of a Dutch snow seen by an unknown artist. Then it seemed to him that life was not worth living any more. Forgetting the bones of his ancestors and how life is founded on a grave, he stood there shaken with sobs all for the desire of a woman in Russian trousers, with slanting eyes, a pouting mouth and pearls about her neck. She had gone, she had left him. He was never to see her again, and so he sobbed, and so he found his way back to his own rooms, and Mrs. Grimsditch, seeing the light in the window, put the tankard from her lips and said praise be to god his lordship was safe in his room again for she had been thinking all this while that he was foully murdered orlando now drew his chair up to the table opened the works of sir thomas brown and proceeded to investigate the delicate articulation of one of the doctor's longest and most marvelously contorted con uh, cogitations cognitations for though these are not matters on which a biographer can professly enlarge, it is plain enough to those who have done a reader's part in making up from bare hints dropped here and there the whole boundary and circumference of a living person can hear in what we only whisper a living voice, can see, often when we say nothing about it, exactly what he looks like. No, without a word to guide them precisely what he thought, and it is for readers such as these that we write. It is plain then to such a reader that Orlando was strangely compounded of many humours, of melancholy, of indolence, of passion, of love, of solitude, to say nothing of all those contortions and subtleties of temper which were indicated on the first page when he slashed at a dead nigger's head, cut it down, hung it chivalrously out of his reach again, and then betook himself to the window seat with a book. The taste for books was an early one. 
As a child, he was sometimes found at midnight by a page still reading. They took his taper away, and he bred glowworms to serve his purpose. They took the glowworms away, and he almost burnt the house down with a tinder. To put it in a nutshell, leaving the novelist to smooth out the crumpled silk and all its implications, he was a nobleman afflicted with a love of literature. Many people of his time, still more of his rank, escaped the infection and were thus free to run or ride and make love at their own sweet will. But some were early infected by a germ said to be bred of the pollen of the Ashfoldol. Ashfold and to be blown out of Greece and Italy, which was of so deadly a nature that it would shake the hand as it raised to strike, and cloud the eye as it sought its prey, and make the tongue stammer as it declared its love. It was the fatal nature of this disease to substitute a phantom for reality, so that Orlando, to whom future had given every gift, plates, linen, houses, men's servants, carpets, beds in profusion, had only to open a book for the whole vast accumulation to turn to mist. The nine acre of stone, which were his house, vanished. One hundred and fifty indoor servants disappeared. His eighty riding horses became invisible. It would take too long to count the carpets, sofas, traperings, china plate, crates, chafing dishes and other movables often to be beaten gold which evaporated like so much sea mist under the miasma. So it was, and Orlando would sit by himself reading, a naked man. The disease gained rapidly upon him now in his solitude. He would read often six hours into the night, and when they came to him for orders about the slaughtering of cattle or the harvesting of wheat, he would push away his folio and look as if he did not understand what was said to him. This was bad enough, and wrung the hearts of Hall, the falconer of Gars, and the groom of Mrs. Grimditch, the housekeeper of Mr. Dumper, the chaplain. A fine gentleman like that, they said, had no need of books. Let him leave books, they said, to the palisade or the dying. But worse was to come, for once the disease of reading has laid upon the system, it weakens it so that it falls an easy prey to that other scourge that dwells in the ink pots and festers in the quill. The wretch takes to writing, and while this is bad enough in a poor man whose only prosperity is a chair and a table set beneath a leaky roof, for he has not much to lose after all, the plight of a rich man who has houses and cattle made servants asses and linen and yet writes books is pitiable in the extreme the flavour of it all goes out of him he is riddled by hot irons gnawed by victims he would give every penny he has such as the malignity of the germ to write one little book and become famous yet all the gold in peru will not buy him the treasure of a well-turned lion so he falls into consumption and sickness blows his brains out turns his face to the wall it matters not in what attitude they find him. He has passed through the gates of death and known the flames of hell. Happily, Orlando was of strong constitution, and the disease, for reasons presently to be given, never broke him down as it has broken many of his peers. But he was deeply smitten with it, as the sequel shows. For when he had read for an hour or so in Sir Thomas Brown and the bark of the stag and the call of the night watchman showed that it was the dead of night and all safe asleep, he crossed the room, took a silver key from his pocket and unlocked the doors of a great inlaid cabinet which stood in the corner. Within were were some fifty drawers of cedar wood and upon each was a paper neatly written in Orlando's hand. He paused as if hesitating which to open. One was inscribed the death of Ajax, another the birth of Pyramus, another Iphigenia in Olis, another the death of Hippolytus, another Meliga, another the return of Asidius. In fact, there was scarcely a single drawer that lacked the name of some methodical personage at a crisis of his career. In each drawer, a document of considerable size were written over Orlando's hand. The truth was that Orlando had been afflicted thus many, for many years. 
Never had any boy begged apples as Orlando begged paper, nor sweet meats as begged he begged ink. Stealing away from talk and games, he had hidden himself behind curtains in priest's holes or in the cupboard behind his mother's bedroom, which had a great hole in the floor and smelt horribly of starling's dung with an ink horn in one hand, a pen in the other, and on his knee a roll of paper. Thus had been written, before he was turned twenty-five, some forty-seven plays, history, romances, poems, some in prose, some in verse, some in French, some in Italian, all romantic and all long. One he had had printed by John Ball of Feathers and Coronet opposite St. Paul's Cross, Cheapside, but though the sight of it gave him extreme delight, he had never dared show it even to his mother, since to write much more to publish was, he knew, for a nobleman an inexplicable disgrace. Now, however, that it was the dead of night and he was alone, he chose from the repository one thick document called uh, Xenophilia, a tragedy or some such title, and one thin one called simply The Oak Tree. This was the only monosyllabic title among the lot, and when he approached the inkhorn, fingered the quill and made other such passes as those addicted to the vice begin their rites with, but he paused. As this pause was of extreme significance in his history, more so indeed than many acts which bring men to their knees and make rivers run with blood, it behoves us to ask why he paused, and to reply after due reflection that it was for some such reason as this. Nature, who has played so many queer tricks upon us, making us so unequally of clay and diamonds, of rainbow and granite, and stuffed them into case, often of the most incon. Uh, Gruus, for the poet, has a butcher's face, and the butcher's is a poet, butcher or poet's nature, who delights in muddle and misery, so that even now, the 1st November 1927, we know not why we go upstairs or why we come down again. Our most daily movements are like the passage of a ship on an unknown sea, and the sailors at the masthead asked, pointing their glasses to the horizon, is there land or is there none? To which... If we are prophets, we make answer, yes. If we are truthful, we say no. Nature, who has no so much to answer for besides the perhaps unwieldy length of this sentence, has further complicated her task and added to our confusion, providing not only a perfect rag bag of odds and ends with us, a piece of policeman's trousers lying cheek by jowl with Queen Alexandra's wedding veil, but has contrived that the whole assortment shall be lightly stitched together by a single thread. Memory is the seamstress, and a capricious one at that. Memory runs her needle in and out, up and down, hither and thither. We know not what comes next or what follows after. Thus, the most ordinary movements in the world, such as sitting down at a table and pulling the inkstand towards one, may agitate a thousand odd disconnected fragments. How bright, how dim, hanging and bobbing and dipping and flaunting like the under linen of a family of fourteen on a line in a gale of wind. Instead of being a single downright bluff piece of work of which no man need feel ashamed, our commonest deeds are set about with a flustering and flickering of wings, a rising and falling of lights. Thus it was that Orlando, dipping his pen in the ink, saw the mocking face of the lost princess and asked himself a million questions, instantly which were as arrows dipped in gall. Where she was and why had she left him? Was the ambassador her uncle or her lover? Had they plotted? Was she forced? Was she married? Was she dead? All of which so drove their venom into him that, as if to vent his agony somewhere, plunged his quill deep into the inkhorn that the ink spurted over the table, which acts explain it in how one may. And no explanation perhaps is possible. Memory is inexplicable at once substituted for the face of the princess a face of a very different sort. But whose was it? he asked himself, and he had to wait perhaps half a minute looking at the new picture which lay on top of the old, as one lantern aside is half seen through the next, as before he could say to himself, this is the face of that rather fat, shabby man who sat in Twitchetit's room ever so many years ago, when old Queen Bess came here to dine, and I saw him. 
Orlando continued catching at another of those little coloured rags sitting at the table as I peeped in on my way downstairs and he had the most amazing eyes, said Orlando. That ever were, but who the devil was he? Orlando asks, for here memory added to the forehead and eyes, first a coarse grease stained ruffle, then a brown doublet, and finally a pair of thick boots such as sisters and wear in Cheapside. Not a noble man. Not one of us, said Orlando, which he would not have said aloud, for he was the most courteous of gentlemen, but it shows what an effect noble birth has upon the mind, and incidentally how difficult it is for a nobleman to be a writer. A poet, I dare say, by all the laws, memory, having disturbed him sufficiently, should now have blotted the whole thing out completely, or have fetched up something so idiotic and out of keeping, like a dog chasing a cat or an old woman blowing her nose in a red cotton hanger sheaf, that in despair of keeping pace with her vagaries, Orlando should have struck his pen in earnest against the paper. For we can, if we have the resolution, turn the hussy, memory, and all her ragtag and bobtail out of the house. But Orlando paused. Memory still held him before, still held before him the image of a shabby man with big bright eyes. Still he looked, still he paused. It is these pauses that are our undoing. It is then that sedition, sedition enters. The fortress and our troops rise in insurrection. Once before he had paused, and love, with its horrid rout, its shawms, its symbols, its heads, with gory locks torn from the shoulders, had burst in. From love, he had suffered tortures of the damned. Now, again, he paused, and into the breach thus made leapt ambition, the harridan, and poetry, the witch, the desire of fame, the strumpet, all joined hands and made of his heart their dancing ground. Standing upright in the solitude of his room, he vowed that he would be the first poet of his race and bring immortal lustre upon his name. He said, reciting the names and exploits of his ancestors, that Sir Boris had fought and killed the Paynim, Sir Gawain, the Turk, Sir Miles, the Pole, Sir Andrew, Frank, Richard, Austrian, Jordan, the Frenchman, and Sir Herbert, the Spaniard, but of all the killing and campaigning, that drinking and love-making, that spending and hunting and riding and eating, what remained? A skull, finger... Whereas he said, turning to the page of Sir Thomas Brown, which lay open upon the table, and again he paused, like an incantation raising, rising from all parts of the room, from the night wind and the moonlight rolled the divine melody of those words, which lest they should outstare this page, we will leave where they lie entombed, not dead, embalmed rather, so fresh is their colour, so sound their breathing, and Orlando comparing that achievement with those of his ancestors cried out that they and their deeds were dust and ashes, but this man and his words were immortal. He soon perceived, however, that the battles which Sir Miles and the rest had raged against armed knights to win a kingdom were not half so arduous as this which he now undertook to win immortality amongst the English language. Anyone moderately familiar with the rigorous, rigors of composition will not need to be told the story in detail, how he wrote and it seemed good, read and it seemed vile, corrected and tore up, cut out, put in, was in ecstasy, in despair, had his good nights and bad mornings, snatched at ideas and lost them, saw his book plain before him and it vanished, acted his people's parts as he ate, mouthed them as he walked, now cried, now laughed, vacillated between this style and that, now preferred the heroic and pompous, next the plain and simple, now the vales of Temp, then the fields of Kent or Cornwall, and could not decide whether he was the divinest genius 
or the greatest fool in the world. It was to settle this last question that he decided, after many months of such feverish labour, to break the solitude of years and communicate with the outer world. He had a friend in London, one Giles Isham of Norfolk, who, though of gentle birth, was acquainted with writers and could doubtless put him in touch with some members of that blessed, indeed sacred fraternity. For to Orlando, in the state he was in now, there was a glory about a man who had written a book and had it printed, which outshone all the glories of blood and state. To his imagination it seemed as if even the bodies of those instinct with such divine thoughts must be transfigured. They must have Aurelios for hair, incessants for breath, and roses must grow between their lips, which was certainly not true either of himself or Mr. Duffer. He could think of no greater happiness than to be allowed to sit behind a curtain and hear them talk. Even the imagination of that bold and various discourse made the memory of what he had and his courtier friends used to talk about a dog, a horse, a woman, a game of cards seemed brutish in the extreme. He bethought him with pride that he had always been called a scholar and sneered at for love of solitude and books. He had never been apt at pretty phrases. He would stand stock still, blush and stride like a grenadier in a lady's drawing room. He had twice fallen in sheer abstraction from his horse. He had broken Lady Winchelis's fan once while making a rhyme. Eagerly recalling these and other instances of his unfitness for the life of society, an ineffable hope that all the turbulence of his youth, his clumsiness, his blushes, his long walks and his love of the country provided that he proved that he himself belonged to the sacred race rather than to the noble, was by birth a writer rather than an aristocrat, possessed him. For the first time since the night of the great flood, he was happy. He now commissioned Mr Isham of Norfolk to deliver to Mr Nicholas Green of Clifford's Inn a document which set forth Orlando's admiration for his works, for Nick Green was a very famous writer at the time, and his desire to make his acquaintance which he scarcely dared ask, for he had nothing to offer in return, but if Mr Nicholas Green would condescend to visit him, a coach and four would be at the corner of Fetter Lane at whatever hour Mr. Glean chose to appoint and bring himself safely to Orlando's house. One may fill up the phrases which then followed and figure Orlando's delight when in no long time Mr. Green signified his acceptance of the noble lord's invitation, took his place in the coach and was set down in the hall to the south of the main building punctually at seven o'clock on Monday, April the 21st. Many kings, queens and ambassadors had been received there. Judges had stood there in their amin. The loveliest ladies of the land had come there and the sternest warriors. Banners hung there which had been at Flodden and at Agincourt. There were displays, the painted coats of arms with their lions and their leopards and their coronets. There were the long tables where the gold and silver plate was stood and the vast fireplaces of wrought Italian marble whose knightly a whole oak tree where knightly a whole oak tree with its million leaves and its nets of rock and wren was burnt to ashes. Nicholas Green, the poet, stood there now, plainly, dressed in his slouched hat and black doublet, carrying in one hand a small dog. That Orlando, as he hastened to greet him, was slightly disappointed, was inevitable. The poet was not above middle height, was of a mean figure, was lean and stooped somewhat, and stumbling over the mastiff on entering, the dog bit him. Moreover, Orlando, for all his knowledge of mankind, was puzzled where to place him. There was something about him which belonged neither to servant, squire, or noble. The head with its rounded forehead and beaked nose was fine, but... The chin receded. The eyes were brilliant, but the lips hung loose and slobbered. It was the expression of the face as a whole, however, that was quite disgust disquieting. There was none of that stately composure which makes the faces of the nobility so pleasing to look at, nor had it anything of the dig 
the five servil servil yeah, serv servility of a well-trained domestic face. It was a face seamed, puckered and drawn together. Poet though he was, it seemed as if he were more used to scold than to flatter, to quarrel than to coo, to scramble than to ride, to struggle than to rest, to hate than to love. This too was shown by the quickness of his movements and by something fiery and suspicious in his glance. Orlando was somewhat taken aback, but they went to dinner. Here, Orlando, who usually took such things for granted, was for the first time unaccountably ashamed of the number of his servants and of the splendour of his table. Stranger still, he bethought him with pride, for the thought was generally distasteful, of that great grandmother Mole who had milked the cows. He was about somehow to allude to this humble woman and her milk pails, when the poet forestalled him by saying that it was odd, seeing how common the name of Green was, that the family had come over with the conqueror and was of the highest nobility in France. Unfortunately, they had come down in the world and done little more than leave their name to the royal borough of Greenwich. Further talk of the same sort about lost ca castles, coats of arms, cousins who were baronets in the north, into marriage with noble families in the west, how some greens spelt the name with an E at the end and others without, lasted till the venison was on the table. Then Orlando contrived to say something of Grandmother Mile to her and her cows, and had eased his heart a little of its burden by the time the wild fowl were before them. But it was not until the Mamsey was passing freely, that Orlando dared mention what he could not help thinking a more important matter than the greens or the cows, that is to say, the sacred subject of poetry. At the first mention of the word, the poet's eyes flashed fire. He dropped the fine gentleman air he had worn, dumped his glass on the table, and launched into one of the longest, most intricate, most passionate and bitterest stories that Orlando had ever heard save from the lips of a jilted woman about to play of his another poet a critic of the nature of poetry itself orlando only gathered that it was harder to sell than prose and though the lines were shorter took longer in the writing so the talk went on with ramifications interminable until Orlando ventured to hint that he had himself been so rash as to write, but here the poet leapt from his chair. A mouse has squeaked in the wainscot, he said. The truth was, he explained, that his nerves were in a state where a mouse's squeak upset them for a fortnight. Doubtless the house was full of vermin, but Orlando had not heard them. The poet had then gave Orlando the full story of his health for the past ten years or so. It had been so bad that one could only marvel that he still lived. He had had the palsy, the gout, the arg, the dropsy, and the three sorts of fever in succession, added to which he had an enlarged heart, a great spleen, and a diseased liver. But above all he had, he told Orlando, sensations in his spine which defied description. There was one knob about the third from the top, which burnt like fire, another about second from the bottom, which was cold as ice. Sometimes he woke with a brain like lead, but others it was as if a thousand wax tapers were alight and people were throwing fireworks inside him. He could feel a rose leaf through his mattress, he said, and knew his way almost about London by feel of the cobbles. Although he was a piece of machinery so finely made and curiously put together, he raised his hand as if unconsciously, and indeed it was of the finest shape imaginable, that it confounded him to think that he had only sold five hundred copies of his poem, but that, of course, was largely due to the conspiracy against him. All he could say, he concluded, banging his fist upon the table, was that the art of poetry was dead in England. How that could be with Shakespeare, Marlowe, Ben Jonson, Brown, Don all now writing, or just having written, Orlando reeling off the names of his favourite heroes could not think. Green laughed sardonically. Shakespeare, 
he admitted, had written some scenes that were well enough, but he had taken them chiefly from Mar Marlowe. Marlowe was a likely boy, but what could you say of a lad who died before he was thirty? As for Brown, he was for writing poetry and prose, and people soon got tired of such conceits as that. Don was a mountbank who wrapped up his lack of meaning in hard words. The gulls were taking in, but the style would be out of fashion twelve months hence. As for Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson was a friend of his, and he never spoke ill of his friends. No, he concluded, the great age of literature is past. The great age of literature was the Greek. The Elizabethan age was inferior in every respect to the Greek. In such ages, men cherished the divine ambition which he might call the Gloria. He pronounced it Gloria, so that Orlando did not at first catch his meaning. Now all young writers were in the pay of the booksellers and poured out any trash that would sell. Shakespeare was the chief offender in this way, and Shakespeare was already paying the penalty. Their own age, he said, was marked by precious conceits and wild experiments, neither of which the Greeks would have tolerated for a moment, much though it hurt him to say it, for he loved literature as he loved his life. He could see no good in the present and had no hope of the future. Here he poured himself out another glass of wine. Orlando was shocked by these doctrines, yet could not help observing that the critic himself seemed by no means downcast. On the contrary, the more he denounced his own time, the more complacent he became. He could remember, he said, a night at the Cock Tavern in the Fleet Street, when Kit Marlowe was there and some others. Kit was in high feather, rather drunk, which he easily became, and in a mood to say silly things. He could see him now, brandishing his glass at the company, and hiccuping out, stap my vitals, Bill. This was to Shakespeare. There's a great wave coming, and you're on top of it, by which he meant, Green explained, that they were trembling on the verge of a great age in English literature, and that Shakespeare was to be a poet of some importance. Happily for himself, he was killed two nights later in a drunken brawl, and so did not live to see how his prediction turned out. Poor foolish fellow said Green, to go and say a thing like that. A great age, forsooth. The Elizabethan, a great age. So, my dear lord, he continues, settling himself uncomfortably in his chair and rubbing the wine glass between his fingers, we must make the best of it, cherish the past and honour those writers. There are still a few left of them who take antiquity for their model and write, not for pay, but for glory. Orlando could have wished him a better accent. Glora, said Green, is the spur of noble minds. Had I a pension of three hundred pounds a year paid quarterly, I would live for Glora alone. I would lie in bed every morning reading Cerso. I would imitate his style so that you couldn't tell the difference between us. That's what I call fine writing, said Green. That's what I call Glora but it's necessary to have a pension to do it. By this time, Orlando had abandoned all hope of discussing his own work with the poet, but this mattered the less, as the talk now got upon the lives and characters of Shakespeare, Ben Johnson and the rest, all of whom Green had known intimately, and about whom he had a thousand anecdotes of the most amusing kind to tell. Orlando had never laughed so much in his life. These, then, were his gods. Half were drunken, and all were amorous. Most of them quarrelled with their wives, not one of them was above a lie or an intrigue of the most paltry kind. Their poetry was scribbled down on the backs of washing bills held to the heads of princes' devils at the street doors. Thus Hamlet went to press, thus Lear, thus Othello. No wonder, as Green said, that these plays show the faults they do. The rest of the time was spent in carousing and junketing in taverns and in the beer gardens when things were said that passed belief for wit and things were done that made the utmost frolic of the courtiers seem pale in the comparison all this green told with a spirit that roused orlando to the highest pitch of delight he had a power of mimicry that brought the deed the dead to life and could say the finest things of books provided they were written three hundred years ago 
So time passed and Orlando felt for his guests a strange mixture of liking and contempt, of admiration and pity, and as well as something too indefinite to be caused by any one name, but had something of fear in it and something of fascination. He talked incessantly about himself, yet was such good company that one could listen to the story of his uh, adieu forever. Then he was so witty, then he was so irrelevant, then he made so free with the names of God and women, then he was so full of queer crafts and had such strange law in his head, could make salad in 300 different ways, knew all that could be known of the mixing of wines, played half a dozen musical instruments and was the first person and perhaps the last to toast cheese in the great Italian fireplace. That he did not know a geranium from a carnation, an oak from a birch tree, a mastiff from a greyhound, a take from the ewe, wheat from barley, plough land from fallow, was ignorance of the rotation of the crops, thought oranges grew underground and turbots on the trees, preferred any townscape to any landscape. All this and much more amused Orlando, who had never met anybody of his kind before. Even the maids who despised him tittered at his jokes, and the men servants who loathed him hung about to hear his stories. Indeed, the house had never been so lively as now that he was there, all of which gave Orlando a great deal to think about and caused him to compare the way of his, this way of life with the old. He recalled the sort of talk he had been used to about the king of Spain's apoplexy or the mating of a bitch. He bethought him how the day passed between the stables and the dressing closet. He remembered how the lords snored over their wine and hated anybody who woke them up. He bethought him how active and valiant they were in body, how slothful and timid in mind, worried by these thoughts and unable to strike a proper balance. He came to the conclusion that he admitted to his house a plaguy spirit of unrest and would never suffer him so sleep sound again. At the same moment, Nick Green came to precisely the opposite conclusion. Lying in bed of a morning on a softest pillows between the smoothest sheets and looking out of his oriel window upon turf, which for centuries had known neither dandelion nor dockweed, he thought that unless he could somehow make his escape, he would be smothered alive, getting up and hearing the pigeons coo, dressing and hearing the fountains fall he thought that unless they could hear the drays roar upon the cobbles of fleet Street, he would never write another line if this goes on much longer he thought hearing the footmen mend the fire and spread the table with silver dishes next door i shall fall asleep and he gave a prodigious yawn sleeping die i do from today